This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmuth. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmuth. On the outskirts of UCF at Central Florida Research Park, one tech startup is working towards making driving significantly safer. Luminar has a goal of saving 100 million lives over the next 100 years using high-tech lasers called LiDAR. It's the same technology autonomous vehicles use to avoid obstacles and navigate the world in 3D. But instead of going all in on driverless cars, Luminar and its 27-year-old founder, Austin Russell, are more focused on creating better driver assist tools and ultimately an uncrashable car. I had a chance to sit down with Russell this week to talk about the company he founded when he was just 17 years old that also made him one of the youngest self-made billionaires in the world. Tell us about Luminar and how you've gotten from when it started, when, your idea, when the idea came to where we are today. Yes, yeah, so the whole concept with Luminar in the first place was to be able to create this uh, LiDAR sensing system to allow cars to see and understand the world around them in 3D. And with that, you, know, you can be able to enable sort of these superhuman-like driving capabilities mm -hmm. that can enable you to avoid accidents all the way to, you know, doing autonomous driving, you know, starting on more constrained scenarios than ultimately expanding a way out. But, um, you know, we had to build something entirely from the ground up and from scratch. And maybe you've seen, like, you know, these autonomous test vehicles out mm -hmm. there before with these huge $100,000 roof racks full of sensing systems and a supercomputer in the mm -hmm. trunk required to run the thing. And you know, we've effectively transformed that by bringing it into the mainstream automotive industry and allowing this to be put on you know, production consumer vehicles you know, that you can even buy. And the whole goal with that is not about replacing the driver, it's about enhancing the driver mm -hmm. and making it accessible for everyone. So. Um, that's really what you've been seeing more and more traction on lately with us as we accelerate. When did that sort of switch? Was it always trying to make driving safer and not replacing the driver? Or w tell me about the how you got to this point and, and what you're doing today. Yeah, I guess there's sort of it's a convergence of multiple sort of big bets that we had, you know, as it relates to you know everything from the technology to the industry and the strategy, the company. And you know, first and foremost, was building a technology that could be scalable uh, for a production car. You know, that that is something that costs more on the order of a thousand dollars than a hundred thousand dollars, and that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. And now you can see us being integrated into, you know, now as many as twenty, you know, production vehicle models across the globe that are planned over the course of the next handful of years. And that's something that really is a transformation. Uh, when it comes down to it, uh, and, and seeing how this can be seamlessly integrated into the roof line of the vehicle as opposed to, you know, um, something that is more only akin to a handful of, of test vehicles yeah. on the roof. And, but, but the other part of it is, is, as you were saying, is enhancing the driver. And that was an, another key part of the overall strategy. Made a big bet early on that um, despite all the efforts in you know this overall industry and next generation capabilities for cars being focused around how do we remove the driver and put it in a ride hailing you know uber like you know mm -hmm. scenario the whole focus for this is about you know enhancing drivers making drivers better saving lives today mm -hmm. um, not just about those autonomous capabilities so i think that's a really important and critical part of this because basically the, the bet was is that it's going to take way longer for than people would anticipate even outside of the industry and within the industry to see that through like building a uh, hundred percent driverless cars is a very very challenging task even with our technology right. on a vehicle that makes it you know finally possible it, mm -hmm. it's it's still um a ways out so the whole thing is is about uh, enabling cars to avoid accidents today mm -hmm. with humans behind the wheel. So it just takes over? Yeah, exactly. So if it senses that you're going to get into you know, mm -hmm. an accident or a collision, it can take over the braking system, take over the steering wheel mm -hmm. to be able to get you out of that situation. These are the kinds of capabilities that we help enable right. uh, on vehicles that are equipped with our technology. It's fascinating. I know that you guys want to save 100 million lives over the next 100 years. That's a goal. Absolutely. Is that realistic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... Uh, Effectively, what that means is that if we're able to solve for you know the majority of vehicle collisions, mm -hmm. you know we'll have no problem achieving the, that goal. Wow. So um, that is something that we've already shown in test cases. What automakers are now starting to show today with the next generation of vehicles that we have. The key is now is seeing this technology through across the industry. Only a um, 
uh, e even even today, even with everything that we're planned into, it's still only a, you know, like a percent of the overall global market, you know, right. for this. Um, you can, turns out you can actually build, by the way, like an insanely valuable business, you know, or, you know, <laughs> like the kind of $100 billion business out of even just having a tiny, a uh, tiny fraction of the overall market because the auto market is just so big. You know, right. arguably the, the the transportation is the largest mm -hmm. industry in the in the world. Um, but the thing is, is that at the same time, um, I think the thing that motivates everyone at the end of the day at Luminar and with our automakers and beyond is that opportunity to save. I mean, as many I mean, a hundred million lives. That's like a you know a we, third we, of the I mean, U.S. You know, I mean, we see we see <laughs> crashes every single day happen. Obviously, and a lot of it is human error. I mean, probably most of it. What's the goal on getting this technology into vehicles that are being sold every single day in a more regular fashion? And I know that you have lined up a number of different major automaker contracts. Um, the latest being Mercedes Benz, and so I know that's huge. But realistically, where everyone is ultimately safer on the roads, what do you, what's the, what's the, the end date do you think you, we really start to see that, that ramp up? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think um, by the end of the decade, um, it would be, and I think, uh, hopefully and generally conservative, we have the opportunity to be on as many, you know, as, uh, you know, five million vehicles, you know, annually as part of that. So basically have a trajectory uh, with, by that time to have as much as like a 60 billion, you know, forward looking order book for mm. uh, for being equipped on vehicles, you know, across the globe. And, you know, I think um, that goes to just the magnitude of what you can have in terms of even, like I said, a relatively small slice of vehicles. Uh, but I think that by that time uh, and by the end of this decade, that will be the opportunity to see through standardization across the broader industry, um, you know, if, if the vision of what we have is to sort of enable the uncrashable car, you know, mm -hmm. so to say, um, then I, I think more likely than not that you end up having a, uh, a regime that's driven by, you know, consumers, regulators, you know, capabilities that like, you know, uh, that it would be more weird to get into a car that lets you crash than one that doesn't. There are lighter companies, but how does, how does it change from company to company and what separates yours from the others? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, when it comes down to it, the key thing with our technology and the key with this is that we built it entirely from the ground up. So we make all of our own components, chips, everything that's gone into it to achieve this breakthrough level of performance. Um, you know, we sort of had our claim to fame by having this huge, you know, 10x improvement in performance capabilities, safety, and what we could enable by seeing very long distances very accurately. Um, in a league that no one else could. And mm -hmm. that was just enabled by fundamental breakthroughs in the core technology that allowed us to be able to do this. Um, and then on top of that, then we started building, you know, software systems and other parts of the stack, as well as, you know, even building our own semiconductors, building our own, like, really end-to-end -end having a solution um, that's sort of packaged together mm -hmm. that automakers can collaborate with us on um, to make this successful as part of a, um, a product that's realized into the end market. So uh, a lot of different things that have gone into that successfully, and we're continuing to expand even substantially through other um, through the partnerships. But that that's the foundation. There certainly has been no shortage of people trying to create the same kind of you know capabilities to technology. People know how important and valuable this is. I think at one point every major automaker, every major tech company, everyone had some kind of LiDAR effort going on yeah. uh, to be able to try and you know, create the uh, capabilities that, um, that Luminar had. But then you also wonder, okay, well, how did we end up beating out all of these you know, major automotive companies, mm -hmm. tier ones, not to mention like the Googles and Apples of right. this world and like actually putting this onto you know, production cars and stuff. It, it was not an easy battle and we were doing so with you know, what like one, one hundredth of the capital. Now, when you think about where tech companies are located, naturally, you would assume Silicon Valley. So why did Russell move Luminar's headquarters to Orlando? We'll have that and much more right after this. Stay with us. This is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. 
Welcome back. 27-year-old Austin Russell became the world's youngest self-made billionaire after his LiDAR technology company, Luminar, went public in 2020. Essentially, his company creates the eyes for self-driving cars, generating 3D images of all vehicles, pedestrians, and other roadway features day and night so it can navigate safely. But Luminar's goal is not full autonomy or removing the driver. They want to use their LiDAR to save lives on the road, and they have inked deals with some of the world's biggest automakers to improve their driver assist systems. We'll talk about why Russell landed on Orlando for Luminar's headquarters coming up. But first, how it felt becoming a billionaire. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, it's sort of... It's the same reason of like, I mean, sometimes when people look at these things on the outside, it's like, oh, these are like overnight successes. In yeah. this case, it's like, it's like a 10 year overnight success, right? You know, it didn't so, just so happen. It doesn't just happen. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, uh, and the hard work that eye. goes into it also exactly. is not necessarily but, seen, yeah. But the key thing, it's also not just, um, it's not just me as a part of this, it's the team. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to is that you have to be able to successfully scale. And like, yes, you know, you have these breakthrough concepts are always pushing the limits of what's possible. Um, but I think the key is, is also just hiring the best and brightest mm -hmm. you know, around the world. And I think one area that we've specifically been able to capitalize on that really no one else has in this space and industry actually is Orlando here. Mm. And you know, turns out this had like the highest concentration of these type of LiDAR engineers out of anywhere in the world, you know, originally wow. starting from the defense industry and other kinds of industries that, you know, built up uh, LiDAR based talent. Mm. So we've been able to hugely leverage that from across the board, you know, you know, what, Lockheed Northrop, mm -hmm. L three, Raytheon, you know, like those kinds of, of companies. And it's just really interesting to uh, to see how that can evolve, and then that's really where you know we've also continued to capitalize on Orlando and Central Florida generally um, by you know making this a, a headquarters and you know bringing talent from mm -hmm. across the globe of the best of the best you know out to here, and um, you know I think that talent part is cannot be understated in in how. Um, you build and scale the company as an operation, and I think today here we are uh, with the majority of the world's talent that's capable of working on these kinds of things at Luminar. So was that a surprise? Did you know that going in? I mean, you said it turns out that Orlando has, you know, this huge talent pool. Yeah. I mean, was that a major factor in relocating your headquarters to Orlando, or was it a nice <laughs> surprise? Um, no, that was that was really the factor. That was the factor. Yeah, that, was that was the that's what separated Orlando from others that I'm sure you were looking at other places to relocate, but it was Orlando's talent pool. Yeah. That, yeah. That that exactly. made it happen. Wow. And I think like that that's the thing, it's like the natural place to establish like on um, and scale headquarters, you know, would be for this kind of company would be in Silicon Valley. Right. Which, that's what people think. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Which we which we do have a strong presence there mm -hmm. and particularly on software. I think mm -hmm. that that's where it's hard to replicate that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to hardware and these kinds of LiDAR systems and everything, like Orlando has been amazing, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes down to it, and, and building that talent base. So I think that was it, that was really a key driver. And then also just seeing the potential, uh, you know, of Orlando and Central Florida generally, I think it was, you know, substantially underestimated in terms of, you know, the kinds of capabilities of what you can get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention um, the relative value of what of what it's offering today, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is, I think, um, an incredible value proposition there too. I mean, do you think some people are going to follow in your in your company's footsteps as far as coming to Orlando, as far as in, uh, because of the the pool that's here and the you're already setting up, you know, a, a huge company? Is that going to be another reason why companies would want to start their business here or, or have their headquarters in Orlando? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, you know the whole goal of what we're doing is, is here is in addition to you know building an amazing business and company mm -hmm. i think hopefully it can be inspiring you know to have orlando as a key global technology hub you know generally and and building um and creating amazing jobs amazing opportunities for for people both uh, locally as well as um i think showing that this can be an, an incredibly attractive region by bringing in um people from around the world and, and the great thing is is that you know, particularly in Florida and a place like Orlando, I mean, it's 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 just continuing to grow. Like it's continuing to scale. It's not, you know, stagnated in some, you know, um, 
former era of, of like what it is or constrained in terms of the mentality of, of thinking around those kinds of topics. So, you know, it's just awesome to be able to see that yeah. as an opportunity and scale along with Orlando. I'm curious too about the red tape that I'm sure you've had to navigate through already. And, and are we seeing that as a major challenge in scaling as well? Yeah. Just, yeah, from the government's side of things. You know, it's a, it's a good question, and I think um, this is actually less of an issue for us specifically. Okay. Um, fortunately, <coughs> um, I would say generally uh, for autonomous vehicles and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. when people are trying to remove the driver, that's where you end up with a huge amount of, um, well, there's the bureaucracy and red tape side of it, mm -hmm. but then a lot of that is also you know, justified sometimes, like uh, particularly these types of tech companies are really good at, you know, throwing regulators sometimes under the bus for things sure. that it's like, okay, well, you can't deploy the technology because the regulators just, mm -hmm. no, you can't deploy the technology because it doesn't work. Right. Uh, you know, right. so, there's a, there's a, so there's there's some yeah. of that, that that's going on. Um, but when it comes down to it, the, the reality is for this is that we're not, you know, removing steering wheels and braking systems and ripping out all these different elements out of a car to make a driverless car. Uh, we're equipping these on existing, you know, certified like production vehicles mm -hmm. um, to enable uh, better collision avoidance and then certain, uh, you know, autonomous capabilities in more constrained environments like highways um, where, you know, but the, the driver is still in, in the seat there. So I, I think the key is, is that, um, enabling that kind of setup, actually, for the majority of the US, for example, not even, I mean, well, for everywhere, you don't need anything, any kind of approval, anything for, you know, it's actually, people are pushing more and more from a regulatory standpoint, better safety standards, so that mm -hmm. helps generally. And then for the autonomous part of it, when you're, when you're talking about uh, production cars, you know, for the vast majority of the US, you actually don't need approval from anyone, you know, for, um, being able to get uh, autonomous capabilities out on the road that we can enable. And the key is, again, you know, is not trying to create like a new, you know, what they call robo-taxi without, without right. a uh, driver behind the, the wheel at all, but uh, putting this on existing production cars. And that's something that I think will definitely continue to transform. But the beauty is it's actually the same hardware that we have on a vehicle that you can see integrating the roofline. It's the same thing that enables the improved safety as it does that also enables the autonomous capabilities as well. So, you know, you kind of get the best of both worlds when you equip on those vehicles. What would you tell someone as far as going from idea to what you're doing today? What would you, what would be the best piece of advice you could give someone to make that happen? You know, I, I think the important part is is uh, three different things have to converge successfully at the same time to make any concept, regardless of what space, what industry, what opportunities, like as an entrepreneur generally, and uh, that's drive, uh, curiosity, and passion. It's the intersection of those three things that enables magic to happen. Mm. And of course, you know, concept, product, business plan, other stuff, you know, have to be good, you know, along right. the way. But as it relates to the individual, those three things are what is the difference between something that was just that concept and something that ultimately had the opportunity to become a business or even a, a multi-billion dollar business. And a few weeks ago, Luminar cut the ribbon on its new long-range LiDAR test facility in Central Florida Research Park, the largest in the world. Another step forward in Russell's goal of saving 100 million lives over the next 100 years. Thanks for joining us this morning. For more information on Luminar, just head to clickorlando.com weekly. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.